federal judge uses one weird trick to uphold a Colorado gun law. Plus, Daring Arms Cam Edwards on the Washington Post's decision to publish graphic photos from certain mass shootings. That and more on this episode of the Weekly Reload Podcast. No, the devil's got no hold on me. All right, welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to another episode of the Weekly Reload Podcast. I'm your host, Stephen Gutowski. I'm also a CNN contributor and the founder of the Reload.com, where you can head over and sign up for our free newsletter today if you want to keep up with the latest of in guns, what's going on with guns in America. And uh, of course you can buy a membership too if you want to support our reporting. That is how we fund our operations here. This week we are discussing the Washington Post's decision to publish a number of um, very graphic photos from mass shooting scenes, or at least specific kinds of mass shooting scenes uh, that they they made this week. And uh, to do that, we have uh, a good friend of mine and, and a fellow publisher of a news website, Cam Edwards, the, the editor of BearingArms.com. Uh, welcome to the show again, Cam. It's good to have you here. Absolutely, man. Thanks so much for the invite, Stephen. Certainly. And you've actually, uh, and of course, Cam is, is also the host of Cam and Company, which you can find on YouTube and, and lots of other uh, platforms as well. And you uh, interviewed a, uh, a Parkland family member who uh, reacted to what the post did. Can you just tell, walk us through some of that interview as we get going here? Sure. Absolutely. Um, yeah. When you, you know, we, we kind of got word that this was coming out ahead of time, right? Uh, Kimberly Garcia, whose daughter was murdered at Rob elementary in Uvalde had shared on social media. Hey, this is coming. Um, don't share this story from the Washington post. I think Sandy Phillips, whose a child was killed in the Aurora movie theater shooting uh, had said something as well that CNN or that the Washington Post had reached out to her. Um, and so the day before this was published, I reached out to Ryan Petty, who's a contributor at Bearing Arms, whose daughter Elena was one of the victims at Parkland. And I said, you know, I, I hate to ask you to do this um, because I know that, and I did hate to ask because I know that talking about this dredges up very painful memories, but I, I felt like it was important Wanted to give him the opportunity to respond. And he said, yeah, absolutely. Let's let's do it. So he joined me on the show yesterday morning um, and we talked about. First, uh, you know, the first question I had was, did The Washington Post reach out to you? And I thought it was interesting. He said, no, that uh, the Post did not reach out to him specifically. There are apparently a group of, you know, Parkland parents who um, I guess talk online on a fairly regular basis. And he said that one individual uh, he didn't name the, who, who that person was, but he said one individual uh, was contacted by the post. And I guess they were supposed to sort of, you know, relay the information to everybody else that this was coming. It, it didn't sound like the post was asking permission. Didn't sound like the post was, you know, asking, are you OK with this even just, um, hey, giving you a heads up. We're going to be publishing this um, in, in the case of Parkland. You know, Ryan said that the families have worked really hard to keep those crime scene photos away from the public um, and that even during the trial of the Parkland shooter, uh, the images were blurred out in the courtroom so that, you know, the, the people in the gallery could not see these you know specific pictures. The jurors saw them, um, but those in the gallery did not. Uh, in this case, he said it was apparently a video that was taken by a student while the uh, shootings were taking place at the Washington Post used. But he said that there was, you know, a, a child who was killed, whose parents identified that child. They knew who they were. And this was a traumatic experience. It did reopen some very painful wounds. Um, and so from there, we kind of talked about, you know, the decision to do this. And I, I read your piece at the reload. I thought, Spot on analysis. I, I I wish we had something to disagree with there, but we really don't I, because I, I said many of the same things at Bearing Arms. Yeah. You know, when we're talking about a news story, one of the first things you learn in J school is every story should answer who, what, when, where, and why. And the Washington Post stopped with what? It was the AR-15. That was the subject of their story. Um, it didn't matter if, if you were, you know, victimized in a mass shooting, which a handgun was used you weren't a part of that story, right? Uh, mass stabbing Washington post didn't care. Um, this was such 
an agenda based story. And Ryan felt the same way um, that this was in some ways very shallow reporting by the Washington Post, that it was designed to elicit a reaction. He called it gaslighting. Uh, Sally Busby's comment that, uh, you know, this was meant to shine a light on the the particular dangers of AR-15s. Uh, Ryan doesn't buy that. Um, he said that it was, you know, disgusting, uh, the reporting from the Washington Post. And I have to say, I I can't disagree with him. Um, and I know that we're going to get into this, but to me, there was there was no good reason for a reporter or a paper to publish these photos unless, again, they had an agenda. And it wasn't about informing the public. It was about inflaming their audience to push for a ban on these particular firearms, modern sporting rifles, semi-automatic rifles, AR-15s, whatever you want to call them. That was, I think, the the entire purpose behind the Washington Post report. Yeah, I mean, I think it's hard to disagree with that, especially because they, at the same time they published the the photos, they published an op-ed that called uh, by from the editors, not just a uh, right, you know, a single person, but the the editorial board of the Post, in concert with publishing these photos, also published uh, an op-ed that called for exactly that. So, uh, it, like, it's fairly on the nose, transparent stuff uh, as to what they were attempting to accomplish with with this, um, and I don't think it is quite uh, what the rationalizations were from uh, Sally Busby. Now, uh, and we'll, we'll, we'll get into, I think, a lot more of the this decision from an editorial standpoint as, you know, as news people. Um, I did invite Sally Busby on the show uh, to, to uh, you know, have a conversation about this. Uh, we've, we've had lots of people on the past that uh, have from all kinds of different perspectives. I would, would actually really appreciate to have a, a, an honest back and forth on this point of why they decided to go this direction, but uh, she hasn't responded yet. Maybe hopefully she will in the future. Uh, but uh, first I do want to talk a little more about the, the victims and the effect this has had, because uh, you know, when I wrote my piece, there was, there were the comments from uh, Kimberly Garcia, uh, which were concerning. Uh, then, then you did the interview with Ryan Petty. And I think people should go and watch that as well. If, if they haven't already, uh, you know, it's over on your, on your channel on YouTube um, and and everywhere else that you can get Cam and Company, uh, but um, you know most of my analysis focused on the sort of editorial side of this and the justifications for doing it. But it, it does really concern me a great deal that they they don't seem to have gotten at least everyone that was could be affected by the publication of these pictures uh, on the same page before doing this. Right. Uh, I mean, if you've made the decision to do this and we'll talk about the logic behind that in a little bit. But if you if you come to that conclusion. You know, I think you would do oh, it, especially because this isn't like a breaking news environment. It's not immediate. Thing. These are very old pictures, many of them. Um, and, and I feel like you have the opportunity to go out and talk to the people who would be most traumatized by these being, the you know, the people whose family members perished in these attacks. And they don't seem to have done that, at least not to an adequate degree, because, which is concerning because they kept talking a lot about in their piece and in the justification for it, that they understood why these don't normally get published by reputable outlets, because they have the ability to re-traumatize uh, victims' families and to dehumanize the victims themselves. That is from the Washington Post. That's what they said as to why they hadn't traditionally published these and why most outlets don't. Um, and you would think if you're going to cross that that line, that you would go and make a, uh, a concerted effort to reach out to, to everyone who could uh, be traumatized by this from who was directly involved with it. You know, it's, anyone could be traumatized by looking at these photos. Um, I think that's fair. But the people we should all have most concern for in this situation are family members. And, and look, some family members do want these pictures out there. I don't want to gloss over that. This is right. this has been an argument among uh, gun control advocates and victims' families for uh, a long time now. I was asked about this on CNN a, last year sometime um, during an attack. This has been something that has been talked about. We'll get into the the logic behind it in a little bit. Uh, I don't want to make I don't want to make it out to be that no family member that 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 they did this without anyone's uh, approval or or 
that it wasn't backed by some family members. But you, I just would expect you'd want all of them to be comfortable with what you're about to do if you're going to do something like this. I, you know, I, I, I guess, I guess they decided that that didn't really matter ultimately. That you know, once they had made the decision that they were going to publish these photos, they were going to share these videos because they felt that they were. Um, important enough or that there was going to be this emotional impact. And again, you talk about, you don't have to be, uh, you don't have to have lost a family member or a loved one. You don't have to survive one of these shootings in order to be traumatized. I think the Washington Post wanted their audience to be traumatized. They wanted an emotional impact, certainly, or else they wouldn't have shared these photos and videos to begin with, right? So they wanted that that visceral gut punch for every reader, every subscriber who saw these pictures um, and I think that ultimately they must have just concluded again, I wish that we had Sally Busby here to ask her directly, but I, my impression is that they concluded that the pain and suffering uh, of some of the victims and their families who did not want these videos shared was worth um, the potential advancement, right, of, of, of this agenda and this desire to ban semi-automatic rifles. Um, I, I, I think it's. I'm with you. I think it's gross. Certainly there are times where uh, you're not going to do something that is within the wishes of the family. Um, you know, there may be, uh, you know, a, 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 any, you know, random crime, right? A strong arm robbery uh, that results in somebody uh, dying. Uh, the victim's family might not want certain details reported, things of that nature. And sometimes there really is a, a, a justification to do so. Right. But again, in this case, the, the justification wasn't based on journalism. That, that, that wasn't the justification. There is no journalistic justification for this. Uh, you know, you talk about some of the other high profile events that we have seen covered by the media and certainly on social media. Right. Which is a whole yeah. other animal. Right. Um, but the the journalistic justification for this, I, I think, was really lacking. Well, and, and I think it's, you know, in, in a way, Stephen, I, it, it's, it's more than just lacking. It is insulting because the entire premise is that, well, the reason why we don't have a gun ban is because people don't understand how awful these murders are when they're committed by someone using an AR-15. And I don't know about you, but I have to say, in all of my conversations over the years with people who oppose these types of gun bans, I, I, I've never really run across somebody who just, you know, blithely dismissed these deaths or who didn't understand the pain and the loss that these victims and their families feel. So I do think it is insulting to those like Ryan Petty um, who don't believe that a gun ban is the answer. Yeah. Yeah. And and I want to get more into that because that was a important part of why I think this ended up happening why why they decided to go that street because it's based off of a uh, a common frustration among both gun control advocates and uh, a lot of media members uh, which is this sort of and you see this all the time uh, right in coverage of guns which is like what will it take is the question what when because the assumption is that uh you know european style gun bans are the answer to this issue and that's the obvious answer and there's no other viable position. So uh, when are we going to do this? What's it going to take? And so this, I think, stems straight from that. Let me give you real quick for, for the listeners. Uh, Sally Busby did write a, a an explanation, a justification for publishing this. And I think, honestly, a lot of people should read that whole thing for themselves, of course. Uh, to try and get some, uh, you know, I would like to have a discussion with her about it. I think that would be more illuminating than just uh, a written piece because, you know, you, she could actually have a, a back and forth in exchange. But uh, here's, here's, I think, the key bit to me, at least from that piece. She wrote, like other news organizations, we cover the effects of these tragedies when they occur. But because journalists generally do not have access to crime scenes and news organizations rarely, if ever, publish graphic content, most Americans have no way to understand the full scope of the AR-15's destructive power or the extent of the trauma inflicted on victims, survivors, and first responders when a shooter uses this weapon on people. So this was her justification. It's very similar to what was written in the actual piece itself, kind of uh, the idea that people just don't understand the 
um, the, the nature of a mass shooting, especially carried out with an AR-15. Uh, well, first, uh, you know, I, I want to dive into uh, when, you know, the graphic, the use of graphic images in, in reporting. Uh, just, just, I think we should just start there because it does happen, right? The Post made a point of this a number of times that this is something you do see uh, sometimes in news reporting. Uh, graphic images are published. Generally, though, those incidents tend to be uh, war zones and, and especially things like documenting war crimes. Uh, I think a really good example would be Buka, Ukraine. Uh, just recently, the New York Times had a whole very well done expose where they did, in fact, publish graphic video, video and pictures of people who were killed in those war crimes. Uh, and you obviously a much more recent example would be the Hamas terrorist attacks in Israel, where we also saw uh, publications, you know, uh, distribute graphic images from those attacks. Uh, it's obviously be become very common on social media as well, which we'll get into too. But I think generally that's used, there's a, there's a purpose behind publishing those foods, and it's not exclusively the shock value of them. Um, my point of view, and I want to see if you agree, um, this is done as a, as a sort of a way of documenting what's happening so that, because in the case of especially war crimes, oftentimes the perpetrators are trying to cover them up or deny that they ever happened. Right. And, and so it can be a valuable service for a news organization with, you know, a respected news organization to publish videos and pictures of them because, uh, you know, uh, and, and it can also serve, I think, to some degree to show the lengths at which an organized group, whether it's an army or a terror group, is willing to go to forward their political, ideological, or religious goals. And I don't know that those same factors come into play when you're talking about uh, an individual mass shooter, but perhaps I'm, I, I'm wrong and, and uh, uh, or I'm not seeing the picture fully. What are your thoughts? I, you know, I, 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 again, I agree with you, but if I try to put myself in Sally Busby's shoes, um, I guess the argument goes something like, well, Stephen, we are trying to uh, expose people, right? The, the gun industry denies that this is a problem. So we want to show uh, you know, the gun industry, just like the uh, just like Vladimir Putin denied that uh, there were, you know, war crimes at Buka. Well, we're 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 not going to let the gun lobby uh, get away with uh, denying that, you know, this is a real problem, that AR-15s are, are, are something uniquely dangerous to our society. Um, and so we are going to show, you know, the horrors uh, that, that can come from this firearm. Again, I don't it, that's the best argument I can come up with if I'm trying to play devil's advocate. Well, and even then, it doesn't really ring true to me. And the post doesn't um, say that in their piece, right? They don't like they 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 are they do say you know they're talking about the the damage that can be brought with with an AR-15 as the particular weapon, um, and we'll get into why that may be a bit misleading as well the way they went about doing this. But to me, you know, it'd be one thing if they were saying, you know, there's conspiracy theorists, Alex Jones types, who will deny that these events happened. Right. And uh, so you could see that as a similar justification with, you know, war crimes being denied. Uh, OK, well, we'll publish the graphic photos to show what happened because conspiracy theorists will use the lack of that to to uh, claim things. But again, one, the Post doesn't claim this. Right. They, don't, they don't use this justification. And two, um, that would be a justification for publishing pictures from all kinds of different mass killings. Um, not just ones that involve the AR-15, which I guess gets more into the the specific problem I have. I, one, I'm not convinced, right, by any of these arguments that publishing these graphic photos is necessary, uh, especially this idea that Americans are unaware of how graphic something like this can be. Because right. this these days, especially with social media, I think it's harder to avoid gory images of, of awful violence uh, than it is not to. You know, like mm -hmm. 
these auto playing videos of massacres around the world or street crime or what, what have you are all over the place. It's not, um, this is not something in the internet age that's, uh, that's difficult for people to find. It's more, honestly, sometimes more difficult to avoid it. Um, so I don't, I don't really agree with that, but, but even if you do go to, let's say you've maybe, uh, maybe you think because of that, there's a, it's just that this old taboo about publishing graphic images is kind of outdated because people see them anyway. Um, I don't know. Maybe that's where you come to. Uh, but the the bigger problem to me is the selective nature of what they do yeah. and how they tried to justify it uh, by sort of twisting themselves into knots about uh, AR-15s, right? The AR-15s are not the most common firearm used in mass shootings or mass killings, Um and so they had to retreat back to a, a new standard, which they said the deadliest mass killings, which is 10 or more killed. If you go, you have to go all the way down their little footnotes to figure out what they're talking about here. And then in 10 of the 18 that they identified, uh, an AR-15 was used. Although they also don't abide by that standard either, because they include pictures from mass shootings that don't meet that standard, but involved an AR-15. They were at least two different shootings in there uh the i think it was the coventry school and there was the uh louisiana bank shooting and, and so they you know they, they they create this they whittle this down and and create kind of a logic pretzel as to why we should only publish ones that involve the ar-15s um and you know I, I think it creates a misleading perception for people they're trying to argue or give the impression that those shootings are going to look a lot worse than, you know, the Santa Fe high school shooting where somebody killed 10 people with a pump action shotgun or the the Waukesha parade where uh, a man ran over and killed, uh, you know, half a dozen people or or what, have, you know, like. To me, it leaves you with an impression that these are that the oh the, it's sort of a it's lie by, by omission, leaving out the gr equally gruesome images from these other kinds of uh, killings. Oh, absolutely. And again, I, I think that's by design. Um, I don't want to give the Washington Post too much credit for for trying to be good journalists here, because I really don't think that they were. I think that they were trying to be good advocates for a gun ban. Um, and, you know, the bottom line is not only as the Supreme Court said, handgun bans are unconstitutional, about 25, about 48 percent of Democrats, according to was it, uh, Pew, I think they're they're in favor of a gun ban. But nationwide, about 22, 23 percent of Americans say that the handgun should be banned. So I don't think the gun control lobby, I don't think uh, anti-gun activists within and without the media are focused on a handgun ban. Um, they view an AR-15 ban or a semi-auto ban as something that is much more achievable. And I think ultimately, I think that's why they focused on AR-15s exclusively, because that's the that's the type of gun that they think they can get a ban uh, in place. Right. I mean, all we got to do is get a couple of Republicans to come along, uh, maybe take back the House and the Senate next year. If we keep the White House, then, uh, you know, they can put a ban in place. And that's why I think that, that that's why they you know, again, they came up with these new standards for the deadliest shootings. That's why they excluded there was not even, you know, not that I would have found this any more appropriate, but there was not even a comparison between a mass shooting in which an AR-15 was the primary weapon of choice and one of which one was not, right? Um, right. We're just supposed to take their word for it that it's somehow worse to be killed by an AR-15 than it is to be killed by a 9 millimeter uh, or a forty five caliber handgun. Yeah, And that to me is where their argument, the wheels really fall off. Right. Because this isn't about. Well, let's make sure that people are murdered in a different way. If that's if that's your goal, you're twisted, man. You've you've lost the plot. Right. The real question is, how do we stop these things from happening? And if that's the question, then banning one type of gun is never going to be the answer. Right. That's where you get into the who and the where and the why that the Washington Post really didn't want to talk about. Um, and so I don't consider this to be an act of journalism. I consider this to be an act of activism. And I don't know how successful it will be, uh, again, when, you know, people who are ostensibly in favor of banning guns, like Fred Gutenberg, say, you know what, this was not the way to try to go about making the argument. 
Um, I don't think that the Washington Post did even the gun control activists a, a lot of favors here. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I don't think it's going to have the intended effect to be honest. Like, I just don't, it, it just goes back to this idea that uh, uh, you see pretty frequently in the framing of, of stories about firearms um, and especially mass shootings, which is, uh, you know, these other, these other countries have solved it by banning, confiscating firearms. Uh, that's the obvious solution. Uh, nobody could possibly think otherwise and be a reasonable person. And therefore, we're just kind of waiting for the tipping point to occur in the United States to when uh, everyone is going to agree with us uh, on this point. And how can we, you know, when is it going to come? How can we get to that? And I think that's where something like this comes in. Well, what if we show people graphic images of, of murder victims? Uh, maybe that'll accelerate uh, this because what's uh, because it's assumed to be that the um i mean the, the i think the real assumption here uh, and it's laid out in what sally busby wrote is that um people are just ignorant of the effect of this of of, of a weapon uh on on somebody you know uh, what what a murder looks like and um and that if they just saw it you know that then they would change their minds and agree with, I mean, you see this a lot in the reaction to the story from people who agree with the publication of these pictures. That's basically exactly what they've all been saying on social media. Um, and in quotes in the Washington post itself, which did uh, sort of the classic big paper thing of like, we, we broke a, we, we, we published something very, uh, that got a lot of attention and we're going to write a reaction piece, cover the reaction to our piece kind of situation. Um, mm -hmm. And and yeah, in, in there, you can see the exact logic being laid out of like, maybe now everyone will agree with us. And uh, and I just don't think that's what actually keeps people from agreeing with them. That I don't think there's anyone out there who looks at what happened at Uvalde or Sandy Hook or any of these mass killings and thinks, oh, it's not so bad. Right? Like, that's just right. not the reaction that any pro-gun person has it's just a total misunderstanding of the the values here I mean, that's it's a it's a completely different reason that people oppose these policies uh and they're absolutely they're a and and so uh yeah i mean i don't see an impact and i imagine you don't think it's gonna actually fundamentally change the debate do you no i i think that people who are uh in support of a gun ban some of them are going to be you know more supportive uh and maybe they'll get off the couch and maybe they'll become you know active advocates for a gun ban but mm -hmm. i i don't see this changing people's minds and you know this wasn't something that came up in yesterday's conversation with ryan petty but he and i have talked about this before um ryan's daughter elena his their favorite activity together was going to the gun range and, you know, uh, Elena shot AR-15s. Um, Ryan, after his daughter died, wrestled with this and actually kind of, you know, thought out, OK, well, what about a gun ban? What about a magazine ban? What about waiting periods? Would any of these things have have actually worked have, to have stopped this? And he came to the conclusion that, no, they wouldn't have. Um, so to me, when. It, it does such a disservice. Like this is one of the reasons why if, if this would have been a true piece of journalism, they should have reached out to Ryan and they should have maybe asked him. So why, why didn't your mind change? Right. Right. Why didn't the murder of your daughter cause you to say, well, let's go and ban these guns because clearly not everybody agrees that that is the answer. Um, but rather than try to, you know, delve into that, they just said, no, this is the answer. You've got to ban these guns. That's the only way to stop these things from happening. And, you know, I, I, I keep thinking about Ryan and I keep going back to Ryan because he helped me a lot after my son passed away last year. And we had these conversations um, about, you know, again, what, what could you have done differently? What could society have done differently? Um, my son wasn't murdered. He, he died of alcoholism. Um, and I, I, there was a part of me yesterday when I, you know, saw the post headline, not that I believe this, but, you know, I would find it disgusting if somebody had put a picture of my dead son on a newspaper, uh, with, you know, little airplane bottles of booze surrounding him and, and $5 pints of vodka to make the case that we need to bring back prohibition. 
Um, it's just a disgusting way of arguing things. And again, it's such a surface level. It's such a shallow argument. And this is a look, this is a debate that clearly we're having. Right. But I but I, I don't think The Washington Post wants to have a debate. I think they want to lecture us and they don't want to understand why somebody like Ryan Petty can lose their daughter and not become a gun control activist. And, you know, Ryan has become a school safety activist. Um, he is very much in favor of doing things that that would stop. He believes would be more effective at stopping these things from happening in the first place. Uh, he and I talked yesterday about the failures of government in Parkland in particular. And, and we've seen these failures in Lewiston. Saw these failures in uh, Sutherland Springs, Texas. Um, you know, all too often, it's not just that we look back and, and in hindsight, oh, we should have caught this. It's we look back and say, in hindsight, there were failures. Yeah. There were there were not only opportunities, but there were obligations that were not fulfilled that could have prevented these things from happening. And again, to simplify this, to dumb this down to uh, it's this particular type of gun. And if you don't agree, there must be something wrong with you, which I think ultimately is the, the gist of the Washington Post story. Right. If, if you can look at these pictures and still don't think that we should ban AR-15s, what the hell's wrong with you? Why do you care more about your rights than dead kids? Why do you care more about your guns than public safety? And that misses the entire point that half the country has, right? That it's not that we're uncaring. How dare somebody suggest that Ryan Petty doesn't love his daughter or that he loves his guns more than he loves his child? How dare someone do that? And Poe Murray from Newtown Action Alliance said exactly that last October. Yeah. Um, so that is clearly, you know, an attitude that is uh, present among oh, the yeah. anti-gun groups. It certainly is certainly one that you see. Uh, and I even had a, a New York Times uh, columnist uh, make that basic argument about me because I wrote my, my piece uh, questioning the, the Post's decision here. Uh, and, and I agree with you here that the you know, Ryan Petty's view, I think, is much more representative of what actual pro-gun people think you know that that and that would be a much more nuanced conversation if you had to uh represent that in reporting like this than uh represent this uh, sort of i uh, you know instead of going with this concept of like false consciousness that gun owners just don't understand that guns are dangerous and that being shot is bad like people right uh, people do understand that uh, i think people uh also do realize the brutality of a mass killing, uh, you know, regardless of what kind of gun or weapon really generally it's carried out with. Uh, they just have different values about what, uh, what is important and, and also different judgments of what would be an effective way to combat the problem. So, yeah, I, I you know, and that's the real issue at the bottom of all this to me is uh, you know you, what this shows, as you mentioned, is a, I think a complete misunderstanding of such a huge section of the country that this paper is supposed to be servicing, like the, they're supposed to be covering, and they clearly don't even have a basic grasp of what half the nation believes on these this this topic, and instead they're pulling what is at least to some extent a stunt designed to combat an argument that is not actually one most people believe in right like it's yeah it just isn't the case that most people think mass killings and mass shootings are a-okay and not a big deal because they haven't seen pictures of them the aftermath right it, it, no you, you put it very well and you know the idea that you would combat this was ultimately a straw man argument um, with these graphic images, again, I, I, I think it's a it's more than just a journalistic misstep um, on the part of The Washington Post. I, I really I don't just question the journalistic judgment of Sally Busby and these reporters and the editors of The Washington Post. I, I question their moral judgment as well. Um, and I'm sure that they question mine. But sure. um, again, this is probably this is maybe revealing as to the uh, the depths of our disagreement uh, in this country, because you know, they can't understand, <clears throat> excuse me, why 
why I don't support a ban on AR-15s. And I can't understand why they would honestly believe for a second that publishing these photos and these videos um, is appropriate in any way, shape, or form, uh, or, or advancing their cause uh, in any way, shape, or form. Yeah. Well, like I said, you know, uh, I, I would really appreciate it, uh, having Sally Busby or someone else from the Washington Post who can speak to the decision making process here and and give uh, you know their their honest uh, point of view on it. Uh, I think that would be beneficial for everyone. But uh, uh, you know, so that's an open invitation going forward. But we really appreciate that you were able to come on and and give your perspective, especially as somebody who's been in the news business for decades and has dealt with these topics. Uh, and 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 also is willing to share you know some personal uh effect as well here uh, i really do appreciate you taking the time to do that um and 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 you know we'll have to have you on again in the future you know i love having you on the show we did a sort of crossover event this week because i was on your show earlier people should right. go and, and check that episode out but if they want to find more from from you cam and your writing and and the show where can they do that Sure. Well, first of all, Liz, I got to say thank you for the invite. This is, I will never turn down an opportunity to hang out with Stephen Gutowski uh, on camera or off. So um, I do appreciate you letting me spend some time with you today. But uh, yeah, folks can check out barryandarms.com. You can look up Barry and Arms Cam and Company on YouTube, all the major podcast platforms. We're on Spotify and SoundCloud and all the rest. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I want to just thank you, Stephen, for your thoughtfulness. Um, you know, too often, I think on, on either side of the second amendment debate, we have bumper sticker sloganeering, uh, we have, you know, again, very surface level, uh, analysis and just sort of knee jerk reactions. And, um, you, 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 you are someone of substance, uh, and you do like to dig in to these issues. And I think we need more of that, not just in terms of second amendment reporting, but, uh, frankly, uh, across the whole spectrum of news these days. So thank you for what you do, man. Hey, I appreciate that, Cam. And I feel the same way about you as well. Uh, and, and you're somebody that I've, uh, uh, always, always looked up to and appreciated in, in this industry. So uh, I really appreciate you saying that. Um, absolutely, man. And, uh, but we're going to head over to our, our news update. Now we'll have to have you uh, on again, maybe in a couple of weeks. Uh, I just always appreciate having your perspective because I think you're one of the best out there. So, uh, thanks well, thank again. you so much. All right, man. We'll, we'll talk again soon. All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the weekly news update. I'm contributing writer Jake Fogelman, joined as always by Reload founder Stephen Gutowski. How are we doing, Steve? I'm doing pretty good. How are you doing, Jake? Doing all right. Uh, listeners can probably tell I'm dealing with a little bit of a head cold right now. So hopefully yeah. you guys can can bear with me through the, the nasally talk. But other than that, doing well. Yeah, there's also like some sort of construction going on outside of my apartment. So I don't know if microphone is picking up hopefully not but uh if you hear like a jackhammer that's why <laughs> um, so uh yeah but uh, i've actually had a pretty good week so far this week um i was uh I took a friend shooting um actually I've taken a number of uh, of uh, jewish friends to the range uh you know over the last couple of weeks as you might imagine uh that's i think a lot of people have been uh, doing the same thing across the country, but yeah, I went, went shooting this week. Friend got a gun for the first time and, and, uh, just wanted some basic, uh, safety and, and shooting technique stuff. So we, you know, we did an, an hour or two at the range and, uh, he's going to take some more training and maybe get his concealed carry license and, and things of that nature down the line. But it was important to have, you know, a very base level three safety rules and, proper stance and grip and all, and all that stuff. He actually did really well uh, shooting. Some people, you know, in my experience from teaching people over the years, like some people just kind of take to it a little bit easier. They don't flinch. They don't, um, you know, they, they're just kind of naturals. Uh, that, that definitely does happen with shooting. Um, most people aren't. <laughs> most people don't take to it right away. Most people flinch a lot early on. Um, and so I actually wonder if, I, cause I started him, I was going to start him with a 22, like I normally would, but, uh, I didn't, uh, bring my 22 ammo <laughs> with me and I forgot to buy some when we were in the store. And then I was just like, well, 
you know what? We can just start with my full size nine and go from there and, and see, see how it goes. And may, I wonder if that might've helped because, you know, a lot of people start to flinch when you move up from the 22 to the nine or the, and then to the 45 or something like that. Um, so I don't know, maybe I'll change my approach, but the 22 is usually the best thing to start on. Uh, cause the, there really isn't much recoil at all, but, but I do wonder if, you know, then when you go up to the nine millimeter and there is some recoil, uh, that's when people get a little bit surprised and start flinching, I think. So I don't know. I'll have to test that theory out. What about you? Did you, uh, have you, how's your week been going? Yeah. So I actually just got back from a trip to Georgia. Um, and I did a little bit of shooting too. So we, uh, visited a family friend out there and, and uh, his family actually owns like something like 500 acres and a farm in South Georgia. Nice. And so part of the trip, we went down there and uh, we got to shoot. Uh, to, to your point about some people being naturals, there was one guy that lives near the farm that came and, and shot with us. And it was his first time ever shooting a handgun. And he picked up a, a nine millimeter SIG handgun and was just ringing steel right away. He didn't even didn't even hold the gun right. But he still was just no flinch and was still hitting the target just about every shot. So to yeah, your point, some people just are just naturals. <laughs> some people are just kind of naturals at it. Also, I feel like the going back to the flinch thing, like flinching is a is a mental issue you know it's it's, yeah. a, it's an issue of your mind recognizing that recoil is going to happen and not liking that and wanting to counteract it and so you try to push back but obviously you're never going to time that correctly you're always going to push back a little bit before the round actually fires and so you're you're going to push down and to the left if you're right-handed and down to the right if you're left-handed um uh, and obviously and so like a new shooter when you're shooting your first couple of rounds you might not have any you're not going to have that mental thought of, oh, here comes the recoil. So it is kind of interesting, but uh, there's so almost there's a sort of advantage to flinching, at least for your first couple of shots as a new shooter. And then uh, most people, not everyone, but most people, it sort of gets in their head and they start to, uh, you know, recognize that recoil is coming and then have that sort of natural reaction to it where you try to counteract. But but yeah, some people just don't have that impulse, really. Um, and I think that's one of the big differentiators for people who are kind of naturals and people who aren't. My dad was was a natural when he started shooting uh, as well. Same same thing. You know, it's just whenever, whenever you, I used to do a class at the free weekend, you'd have like one out of every dozen or so would be like a natural shot. And, uh, and I think it's a big part. Flinch is a big part of that. Um, Cause if you're not flinching, you're not, you're not having like wild variations in where you're hitting. Like, the, you know, my friend this week, it wasn't like he was, uh, you know, putting round on top of round. It was, you know, it was, a, it was a relatively wide grouping. It wasn't terrible, but it was, you know, it was pretty good, but it, you know, it was not like he became an, an expert shooter off the bat or anything. Just some people they pick it up a little bit easier. Yeah, absolutely. Some people have all the luck. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, so uh and and uh we had our our charity range day uh was auctioned off or the, the auction ended I think between the last episode and this episode. So uh you know that we raised a a good amount of money for homes for our troops again. Again, that's a charity that uh, where all the proceeds go to build actual specialized homes for uh disabled veterans uh wounded veterans and um and so i'm always, I'm always happy to be able to contribute to that and uh i'm sure i'll hear from the like if you won by the way if you're listening and you're the winner just reach out to me just email me uh i know i'm sure there's uh like a process that you go through after getting the the uh, receipt from from home store troops or ebay or whatever you can just you just feel free to email me um and we'll set up um, how that's going to happen, you know, pretty flexible on details, but, uh, uh, yeah, just reach out. It'll be a good time. We did two this year because, uh, one of the winners just couldn't schedule, uh, he was, had a lot to juggle. And so we had to push it back a couple of times, but you know, we get through them eventually. If people donate that much money, you're going to get the, you're going to get the experience for sure. So, um, yeah, I'm looking forward to doing that again. Always, always a good time. Uh, Merrill Walters is always, uh, he's a reload member and he lets us, uh, set up on his farm and 
shoot at his range. He's got a nice steel range. He's got a Texas star, all that stuff. And, and, um, so it's always a good time. Um, but I'm looking forward to that one when probably next year, I would guess, cause most, you know, it's going to be pretty cold for the next couple months, but, um, but I'll get that figured out once I hear from the winner. And, uh, yeah. What do we got in terms of, of news stories this week? Yeah. So, uh, some links in the newsletter, we have one that's sort of a continuation on a, a trend we've covered a little bit, but, uh, apparently there's a Republican lawmaker in the state of Kentucky that is interested in introducing it's, you know, my tendency is to call it a red flag law. The lawmaker is stressing that it's not a red flag law, but the same general concept is, is there where you can yeah. temporarily take guns from someone who's considered a threat to themselves or others. And there's some added due process protections, it sounds like, from the reporting here. Um, but it's just interesting to see a red state lawmaker uh, once again back at the well trying to get a, a red flag law to be palatable in one of those states. Yeah, similar to what happened with Tennessee, although that did right. not wasn't successful attempt uh, right by the governor down there um sounds close to what Mar what maine has right they call it uh, you know everybody was making a big distinction that maine doesn't have a red flag law because they have a yellow flag law but it's, it's kind of just it's a red flag law it just has more due process protections like you mean it's just a a different process to go through slightly different really and there's limitations it has to be the police who request it instead of some states allow i think some states allow like almost anyone. Um, but most states fall somewhere in between. Uh, but it's the same basic concept of a policy. So yeah, that people are, draw a lot of distinctions here. When the And interestingly, on either side, you get a lot of gun rights uh, advocates who don't like red flag laws that, that um, uh, want to uh, uh, make a distinction between like main... Uh, and other states red flag laws and you get that on the other end too you definitely saw that in the wake of the uh the mass shooting in in, in maine where you had a lot of media coverage to try and talk about how they don't have a red flag law but they do it's just <clears throat> a little bit of a variation off of uh what a number of other states have done. i mean the lawmakers there don't want to call it a yellow flag instead of red flag but they're the same it's the same mechanisms right uh, so it'd be interesting yeah. to see where that goes because you've written about this in the past you know the um analysis piece about sort of the the ceiling for these kinds of policies right now yeah it's you know the the experience in the tennessee special session kind of was sort of revealing in terms of you know you could do whatever you want in a red state to try to package it differently like you said to try to make a distinction between other red flag laws and oh this one has all these protections so it's not really a red flag law and that doesn't really seem to buy you much favor with with <clears throat> at least red state lawmakers and gun rights advocates and gun rights groups. So uh, yeah. I'll be skeptical to see, you know, if this Kentucky effort doesn't meet the same fate. Yeah, I, I would assume it does. But it's just interesting to see that at least in red states, lawmakers are still trying, um, even though it might not be so fruitful for them in the end. Yeah, but and, and that goes to your point um, uh, in the piece you wrote a while back on there's just uh, not a lot of space left for for red flag law advocates at the moment. Uh, it's just right. a political reality that most red states are not going to pass these sorts of policies uh, as they exist now. And most blue states already have them. Right. Um, and so you have maybe a, some purple states. There's some, uh, although, I don't, you know, there's really not many of those left either. Cause last, you know, you, you had what Michigan, uh, Virginia would be another example. I mean, we have another story this week that about Virginia and the red flag law being sort of um, potentially, tweaked because Democrats took back control of both houses of, of the state legislature here. Um, although of course the governor is still a Republican. Um, so we'll see, we'll see where that effort ends up. Um, but, uh, but yeah, a lot of the sort of more purple States have kind of shifted a bit blue, uh, at least the last two cycles. And, um, so a lot of them have already, you know, Colorado, uh, has one have already done the red flag well uh, minnesota right? Uh, right so there's not a lot not a lot left out there uh for as far as uh, room for red flag well advocates to enact new laws yeah no that's right um the next story we've got is we have a fifth circuit ruling another fifth circuit ruling on the uh biden administration's frame and receiver rule aimed at so-called ghost guns 
where the Fifth Circuit, the three judge panel said that the ATF exceeded its authority rather um, in passing that. Um, and so just yet another ruling basically saying the same thing that we've seen in a lot of these rulings that, you know, this is an unlawful regulation on their part to try to uh, redefine frames and receivers into completed firearms. Yeah, this was uh, the sort of almost a formality at this point, because this is the ruling on the merits, which is technically the most important one. But everybody knew this is what was going to happen because they'd already issued a preliminary injunction. Right. Uh, they already they'd right. already said it was very likely that they were going to strike this uh, this this rule as unconstitutional. And then there was the whole fight over whether or not there should be a stay put on that ruling and the ATF should be allowed to continue to enforce it while the case moves forward. And uh, that's that went all the way up to the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court sided with the ATF and that on that specific question now that's not that's not on the question of whether or not this rule is unconstitutional that, that right. uh, you know that's just a question on whether the stay that allows the ATF to keep enforcing the law during litigation uh should should remain and the supreme court said yes it should uh now you could read that as we've talked about before uh, uh just as a procedural thing like this court wants to keep in place uh, the, the stay procedures that are normal in most um, most lawsuits of this kind S doesn't necessarily mean that the court is going to uh, agree with the ATF on the merits of this law. So um, or this rule, and it's not a law; it wasn't passed by Congress, right? That's one of the big problems, one of the big issues in the case. Uh, so yeah, now, but this this does move the ball forward. It still, the ATF can continue to enforce the rule because that was what the Supreme Court said until until the Supreme Court decides what to do with the case, the stay remains in place. So that doesn't change here. But the ruling does advance, advance the ball, moves the case forward. So now there's only two options left for the government, I believe, which is either to request a full panel of the Fifth Circuit review the case or go straight back to the Supreme Court and ask them to review it. And, uh, you know, I don't think they're going to do the on banc thing because I don't think they would get a, a, any different outcome uh, at the full panel of the Fifth Circuit. It's unlikely that they would come down differently than the panel did, uh, the three judge panel. And uh, so maybe they'll go back to the Supreme Court. I think that's probably what they have, the DOJ is going to do in this case. And we'll see what the court does at that point. Yeah, you know, especially in light of them t agreeing to take up the bump stock ban case, that could also have some yeah. implications for this rule as well. So that that should, yeah. So maybe they'll maybe they'll just wait and give down a ruling in the bump stock case, and and then GVR uh, this case or, or what have you. But we'll yeah. see. We'll see. We'll, we'll keep see. watching. And then the last link we'll quickly touch on is comes to us from uh, America's Quarterly. It's an interesting piece writing up what uh, this writer calls the spread of U.S. style gun politics in Latin America. And it sort of covers some moves in a couple of Latin American states like Brazil, Ecuador. Uh, there was a push in Argentina that didn't actually succeed. But in a few of these states to sort of liberalize their gun laws to allow for more citizens to own firearms and to also be able to carry them publicly, which I think is just an interesting cultural development uh, Obviously yeah. not in the United States, where that's sort of been ubiquitous for at least the last couple of decades. Yeah, yeah. I mean, this has been a trend, especially in Brazil, for a while now, uh, where you've seen the sort of right-leaning parties there. Or, I don't know, Latin American politics, they seem to either have very far-right politicians or very far-left uh, politicians. So, uh, you know, it's... Uh, uh, it's an interesting dichotomy down there, but the uh, at least the right-wing ones have become more amenable to civilian gun ownership, or at least certain civilians owning guns. I, I'd have to look at it a lot closer than I have, but it is interesting shift, especially rhetorically, because they do sound, they do start to sound like American, the, the American gun debate. Um, and we've also seen this in another story. We just, we just wrote uh, one that you, you did this week uh, in Israel, right? Um, now we've been reporting on Israel and, and the increased demand for civilian guns there uh, in the wake of the October 7th uh, attacks by Hamas. Uh, but, you know, one of the other interesting things about it, and we, we had an update this week, there was a, there's, the number got a lot bigger, right? We said 150,000, that was about three weeks into uh, this war with Hamas. 
and now it's up to I believe over two hundred thirty thousand, right? Yeah, a little over two hundred thirty-six thousand. And the one of the other interesting bits is uh, you know in in our exclusive interview with uh, one of the the parliament leaders, the Kinset leader uh, Simcha Rothman, but also in uh, public statements by uh, Ben Gavir, who's one of their um, who's sort of a, the government. Uh, official who oversees the permitting process for guns. Um, they both kind of, the way they talk about guns is does again reflect the American gun debate quite a bit. Um, you don't get as now they don't have the rights aspect like we do here. Um, it's not as much a rights question, but you do get a lot of the idea that armed civilians are a benefit to society because they prevent uh, crime or terrorism. Uh, more specifically in Israel and, and uh, you know, Ben Gavir in, in the story that you wrote, like his, you could, you could hear that from any, you know, NRA or, or Republican official in, in the United States and the stuff he was saying, right? Yeah, no, I thought that exact thing. So I, I, I quoted him in the story. Uh, one of the things he said is because that, you know, obviously 236,000, they said was the most that they've had in 20 years in the last 20 years it equals mm -hmm. that amount. Yeah. So they have a little bit of a backlog as they're working through approving those permits. And yeah, so that's one quote, critique, they, I would say, is they, they, they've got all these applications. I think they're only doing like 1400 a day or, or so. Like it's, I'm sure that's fast paced for them, but it's, I think only like 18,000 people have actually gotten their guns right. so far. But, but anyway, uh, back to the he, rhetoric. Yeah, he, he issued a statement, but basically saying like, you know, don't be discouraged by the backlog. Go out, get armed. Uh, guns save lives. Yeah. Uh, so like you like you said, it almost it's like a way. It could be a Wayne Lapierre quote, uh, but it's I mean, coming guns, from guns save lives. Is uh, well, actually, there's some group. I think the Illinois gun rights group is named that, uh, right. and then that's the slogan for the Virginia Citizens Defense League. Literally, like on all their buttons and stuff. Um, it's a very common refrain here in the United States. So it is interesting, yeah, to see an Israeli official adopting that kind of uh, language. Certainly. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, the point still remains that uh, they have liberalized their, their laws a bit, but it's still bit. nowhere near what it's like in America. Right. They still have ammunition limits. They can't own semi-automatic rifles. Uh, right. So or it's anywhere. not the same, but it is just noteworthy that, you know, it's not the same, but country. it does seem to be moving in that direction or perhaps at least something to watch. Now, again, I think Rothman and, and Gabir are on the further right end of the, the Israeli political spectrum, sure. from what I understand. Uh, I don't, you know, not certainly not an expert in Israeli or Latin American politics, but this is just my general understanding of it. But, uh, you know, I, I don't remember seeing a lot of that kind of rhetoric as uh, often there before now. Um, right. Similar with what happened in Ukraine. Right. Um, and you do. And it does make you wonder if that's, you know, if that's going to be a trend that continues and they do liberalize their gun laws or they do enshrine gun rights as something protected uh, because they don't do that now, but they, you know, the, the way that these officials are talking, uh, you know, maybe that's where they're moving. I don't know. We'll see. It's tough to say, but uh, we'll definitely stay on top of that. And then the, uh, the last story we want to talk about today is one we covered. Uh, I think this might be one of the first of the kind rulings since the uh, Supreme court handed down their Bruin decision, but it's dealing specifically with gun purchase waiting periods. Um, this one deals with Colorado's three-day waiting period, where a judge actually just denied a preliminary injunction. So he upheld that waiting period uh, and did so under kind of an interesting uh, reading of what how that implicates the Second Amendment or how it doesn't actually implicate the Second Amendment. Um, yeah. And then you, you wrote an interesting analysis piece where you characterize it, I think, uh, appropriately. <laughs> yeah, this is what I call the one weird trick uh, approach to Bruin. <laughs> <laughs> I think I think I called it in the piece the the one weird trick theory of Bruin, uh, the one yeah. weird trick that that plaintiffs hate, which is essentially because uh, we we actually saw this once before the logic not it was in it's a different case this was this the other case was uh, about the California's uh, ban on possessing homemade firearms that are unserialized, um, <clears throat> but the the logic in both cases is exactly the same, which is uh, the Second Amendment guarantees a right to keep and bear arms. But uh, it doesn't say anything about buying, making, or selling them, you know, acquiring them. So there's no protection offered to that activity at all uh, by the Second Amendment. That's essentially what both of the judges in these the two cases that I'm talking about here uh, ruled, including this, this Carter appointee, which, I mean, 
Uh, by the way, like impressive that he's still on the bench being a Jimmy Carter <laughs> point. Right. He, he's got to be in his eighties, I think. But um, uh, I guess that's the trend our, our politics have seen lately is that nobody ever retires here. They will keep being president or running for president or staying on the bench or staying Senator until they literally die in that position. It seems like that's where our politicians are at now uh, and our, and our judicial figures, but uh, regardless, um, yeah, he, he ruled that um, the three day waiting period for gun purchases is okay because the plain text of the second amendment does not cover gun sales or gun purchases or, uh, and, you know, presumably this would also extend to shooting, you know, um, doesn't, doesn't actually, it only covers the literal keeping and bearing of them. So, uh, you know, holding ones you somehow already have or, uh, carrying them around on you, but not, I, I guess also not shooting them in any way for any reason, um, and not acquiring. I mean, this is, that's why it's kind of a, a joke. Uh, like I, you know, I, 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 we, our tagline here is sober and serious and I tried my best to, um, take a fair look at, you know, especially in, in court cases at the reasoning that's being used. And there's a lot of disagreement about how to apply Bruin to different questions. And you have a lot of judges, uh, who of good faith, who come down on different sides of the same policy as to whether or not it's constitutional but sometimes you get stuff like this which is just kind of i mean it's not a serious attempt to grapple with the constitutionality of this law there are interesting questions around like what are the limits of regulation on commercial sale of guns right there's uh, there's probably a lot that you could do to look at the do an actual bruin analysis of that and see you know, how, how have we regulated commercial sales of firearms in the past? And like, how does this work? And, and is there some difference today that, you know, the mass production of guns is different than what existed at the founding? Should that factor into a Bruin analysis? You know, there's a lot you can go into and have a serious discussion or serious uh, attempt at, at making that case. But this just isn't that. This is like, oh, right. You know, here's the one weird trick. Um, just, you know, just ignore the second, just say it doesn't apply to anything. Uh, government could ban guns tomorrow if it wanted to, I guess. All, you can't shoot them, you can't buy them, you can't make them. Uh, all you can do is keep and carry the ones you have. You can't, but even if you're carrying them around, you're bearing them, you can't shoot them. And it doesn't say the right to shoot arms. You know, it's just kind of a, uh, an unserious thing. Yeah. And another thing the judge did is is something we've seen in other cases too, is something I call like that the heads heads I win, tails you lose sort of yeah. side of the argument where where they say, you know, this doesn't implicate the plain text because the plain text doesn't say anything about buying guns. But if it did implicate the plain text, here's the history that I right. say would support waiting periods. And in this case, the judge says uh, historical colonial era laws uh, prohibiting intoxicated people from uh, bearing arms covers waiting periods because, well, those laws were aimed at preventing impulsive acts with firearms by drunk people. So therefore, a three-day waiting period, which lawmakers say is about impulsive acts, therefore, those are the same, and that would be a valid historical analog. Yeah, so that, that was another thing, too. Like, he obviously wasn't very committed to this idea that the plain text doesn't, I think he, he understood that that's not going to be enough. Uh, as the case moves along that I don't think that even in the, even in a more left-leaning circuit um, that the higher that, you know, w once it gets to an appeals an appellate panel or the full panel, or especially the Supreme court uh, that they're not going to, they're not going to be satisfied with that explanation. So he did make a, but honestly, it's a pretty half-hearted attempt to do the burn analysis as you just sort of outlined there. He says, there, there were laws that allowed uh, government officials to disarm somebody who was intoxicated. Usually these were like militia um, regulations, essentially like if somebody's on duty, uh, they're carrying their firearm and they're drunk, they could be disarmed. Um, 
And, and he said that is an analog for a three day waiting period to purchase firearms, uh, which is, I think, pretty thin. Um, and interestingly, you know, somewhat ironically, we did have another ruling this week that would more directly implicate those restrictions from the founding era, right? Uh, which was uh, we had a case out of Pennsylvania, out of the Third Circuit, about uh, a man who uh, had committed, he'd been convicted of two different, well, convicted is maybe the right, there's a little nuance here. Uh, he'd been convicted of a DUI in 2005, uh, and it, he received a sentence enhancement because he had previously been arrested for a DUI in 2001, and he had served like a diversionary program for that first DUI arrest where it wasn't a conviction, but if he reoffended within a certain time period, which he did, uh, then that would result in, you know, a sentence enhancement. And so even though this technically under Pennsylvania law is not a felony, um, it's a misdemeanor, it was punishable by up to five years in prison. Now he didn't serve those five years. You can sort of see this, how this stuff gets into the weeds here, but uh, he he served like 90 days house arrest um, because he had a medical condition. But uh, regardless, that qualified him as a uh, the same as a felon under federal law for the purposes of, of lifetime uh, disarmament. And a, a judge ruled that um, his disarming him for life was was unconstitutional, uh, that that the law as applied to him was unconstitutional and that the even though that we're talking about a DUI in this situation. Now, he didn't have a firearm when he was committing a DUI or, or what have you, and it wasn't a, a violent offense. He didn't harm anyone else. Uh, obviously, he could have. He was driving drunk, but he didn't. Um, that there still wasn't a close enough analog because, one, it wasn't a lifetime disarmament for people who were uh, disarmed while they were intoxicated at the founding era, and two, it was only... Uh, when you're actively, like, actually intoxicated and carrying a gun, that those rules applied at the founding. So, um, you know, it's, you, on the one hand, you had a judge whose case was, I think, most people would say, much closer to the the founding era regulations. On the other hand, you had a judge, and he said, "No, this isn't a good enough analog for a number of valid reasons." I think, but uh, and then you have this judge in, in Colorado say, "Well." Sure, that's close enough. It's uh, sort of rel related. That's something about in, uh, impulse. I, I I really don't understand the the how he's drawing an analog there, but but um, yeah, something to do with drunk people are more impulsive, and that makes them dangerous. And uh, people who buy a gun and receive it immediately could act on an impulse, and that, yeah, that's kind of I guess what he's trying to do. Right. But uh, yeah, it's interesting to see the, the dichotomy there between two different federal judges approaching that issue. Um, and I think it underlines how little effort this federal judge put into upholding that that waiting period law. But anyway, I don't know. That's that's uh, just this is something that uh, occasionally you come across a reasoning that's just. I don't think is going to go anywhere and isn't really meant to be terribly serious. Um, yeah. And then the, the, the plaintiffs in this case already said they're going to appeal this to the 10th circuit. And to yeah. your point, it, it, I would be surprised if the 10th circuit echoed this uh, analysis. Uh, Me too. I'll just leave it at that. But. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. I mean, I wouldn't be surprised if they upheld the law by some other means. Uh, that sure. Perhaps maybe a bit more serious examination of the law under Bruin, but uh, but yeah, I don't, I don't think this one's going to be the, the one that does it. Uh, I don't think this is what the court is going to adopt. The Supreme court is going to adopt as a, a logical, uh, interpretation of the second amendment, but, um, we will certainly keep watching that. Uh, we will keep report, reporting on it. And, uh, you know, if you want to get that reporting as, as we go along here, you can head over to the reload.com and sign up for our free newsletter. You get one email a week. Nice. Uh, summation of all the most important stories going on with guns in America. And, uh, you know, of course, if you want to go a bit deeper, if you want to support the reporting we're doing, we are 100% funded by our members here at The Reload, and you can become one of them, and that will get you access to all kinds of exclusive pieces of analysis and reporting that you won't find 
anywhere else. You also get this show a day early and the opportunity to appear on the show in a member segment. If you want to be on the show, just reply to your uh, your Sunday newsletter, which you also get as a member, uh, the additional newsletter on Sundays. Just reply to that and let me know and we'll have you on. Um, but that's all we've got for this week. Uh, we will see you guys again real soon.